mentor is looking for a mentee. They're looking for somebody who can carry the mantle. Mm. And mentees don't want to do the work to become worthy of the mantle, the sacrifice, the blood, the backstabbing. Is, like you, you, you looking, you looking, you looking at my stage, and you don't know the blood that I shed to be on the stage. Mm. You don't know, you don't know what I went through just to stand here and smile. You don't know. You see me smiling and dancing, but you don't understand how much work I had to do to get myself over being uncomfortable, being in the spotlight to even have this position, but yet you want me to just to put you in there mm. after I spent 15, 20 years actually getting myself ready for it. That's good. Welcome to The Dash. You know The Dash is that tiny line between your life start date and end date. It's your story, the chapters in your book, your journey. Your journey. Your journey. Get ready for real conversations with real people telling real stories about the realities of failure, setbacks, and success. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. We're rolling. Let's go. Dash in three, two, one. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Dash Podcast. Thank you guys so much for joining. You guys, always, I'm so appreciative. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. Um, also, hit the like button, share it with your friends. And today we have a very special guest. I'm excited about talking to this brother because I've heard a lot about him, but I don't exactly know his story. Okay. So we're going to, you ain't supposed to say nothing yet, I'm Jake, because I didn't I even introduce okay. you. I was <laughs> okay. You can tell what type of episode this is going to be. No, I'm just joking. Um, Well, as you guys have heard, the voice, Dr. Jake Taylor Jacobs, he calls himself the business doctor. So I want to make sure I I run down all of your titles. Business developer, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Let's get the talk. (laughs) Fund manager and business educator. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much for being here today. For sure. Appreciate you having me. So Dr. Jake Taylor Jacobs. Mm Mm-hmm. But you are not a doctor. You do not perform surgery. You are a business doctor. Yeah, this might gonna be dead. If put me on that <laughs> table. Yeah. Uh-uh. Okay, so tell me exactly what you do, and then we're gonna take it back from there. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, in short, what our firm does, we're a full service consultant, business development, and marketing firm, uh-huh. and we take good companies, make them great, make great companies sellable. What we found out is that most small businesses, specifically black and brown businesses, never build sustainable businesses enough. Mm-hmm. That can become big enough to sell. Mm-hmm. We just make enough money to take care of our lives, and then it kind of dies down. Sure. And it was all for nothing. So yeah. that's kind of what we specialize in. Okay. So I think everybody out there is like, oh, shoot, I need to hear from him. We all want to go from good to great. Yeah. And then we also all want to be sellable. So yeah. um, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about the now, and then we'll go back. Okay. So you have made, and I hate to do this, I hate to put your business out there, but we have to. Um, you've made a lot of great money yeah. uh, doing what you do. Yeah. I would say, <laughs> would we say seven figures? You can go, you can go, you can go higher. <laughs> well, hello. Okay. <laughs> so multiple seven figures. You can go higher. Over $25 million. Good. Yeah. Look at God. Won't he do it? He did it. Uh, he did. <laughs> 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 okay. So I always like to put the number out there because a lot yeah. of us, we need that number yeah. in order to... I guess really kind of qualify you in a yeah. way because we quantify people according to the amount of money that they've made. Yeah. You know, it's just the world we live in. Okay, so let's go back. How did we get to this point? Who is Jake? Where did you come from? Is this something, did you always know you were going to be the business doctor? Um, No, the business doctor actually came by accident <clears throat> and it was given to me by one of my clients. Okay. Um, They had a struggling company mm-hmm. and they were only struggling because of a... A uh, poor strategy. Okay. They started off with a good product and they had like good clout, if you will. They had a good influence. Mm-hmm. So they built their brand just off of who they knew and the mm-hmm. product that they had. Mm-hmm. But their strategy was trash. Their money management was trash. They had no vision, no future, but an amazing product. Mm-hmm. So all we did was spend really just about three to six months with them. Um, three months with the strategy and then three months with the expectation mm-hmm. and the implementation. It completely changed their company. And so they kind of coined, well, you're like a business doctor. And I was like, well, you know what? That kind of is. Yeah, yeah, I like that. That's so that's kind of what happened with that. Okay, but you started <clears throat> out what? Like what What was what was Little Jake? Yeah. Tell me a little bit about Little Jake. Yeah, so um, I grew up around entrepreneurs. My um, father was a loan shark. He was more gangster with it. Okay. 
Um, and then my mother, my mama who raised me, who's my stepmom, mm -hmm. her father um, had three accounting firms in Oak Cliff. Okay. And um, he was the first millionaire I ever met. Now, he didn't leave nobody with nothing. <laughs> he spent every dime, <laughs> every dime, <laughs> and didn't get nobody done. But he taught me basic strategies that I needed. And then my mother's uh, previous husband um, owned three barber shops in DeSoto. Okay. So I was surrounded with people who understood money, did accounting, sold services, businesses. Mm -hmm. So I had a good like circle because I grew up with my father. So uh, that's kind of where it started. And then um, my father lost his job. Uh, my junior year, going into my senior year, and uh, he worked for the Dallas Morning News, mm -hmm. and he took his cat extra cash he made from Dallas Morning News and started lending. He was making like four to eight thousand dollars a month lending, mm -hmm. and um, he lost his job, um, and then totaled like three cars in four months. Just so went through a crazy depression, and he's just now really getting out of it. A couple of damn near fifteen years later, and. Uh, <clears throat> I seen my superhero turn into like a shell of a father. Mm. Um, you you kind of lose that je ne sais quoi, if you will, like when you um, can't provide. And he didn't really, he didn't have a degree. Mm -hmm. And so like he worked his way up from the mail room for them to let him go as a, you know, senior manager. Mm. And then him starting over would be hard. Saw my mom uh, crying in the kitchen. And uh, I asked her why she was crying. She said she was cutting onions. And I know she thought I was dumb, but she was only cutting celery. And so I didn't see no <laughs> onions around. <laughs> so there's no way you, you know what I mean? Just tell me the truth. Yeah. But I already kind of knew what was up because my dad never sugarcoated nothing with me. Right. And so I went and studied under a kid named Bad Batati, but he was selling candy at Cedar Hill. And he was trash. He didn't he count. He was selling trash or selling the candy? No, no. He was selling candy, but he was trash. Like, Knowing his numbers, knowing the candy that was going out, cause they did it for leisure. I needed it for to help my mama with rent, mm -hmm. with mortgage, mm -hmm. and uh, so I worked under him for a little bit, and then I realized he didn't count inventory, and then I wasn't really the popular one, but everybody messed with me cause I played ball. I was good at basketball, mm -hmm. and so I was like, okay, now the people that he got selling his candy, they don't really respect him cause they know he don't count nothing. He just wanted an extra like thirty dollars. So this is in high school. Yeah. So this is in high school, and when you say you worked underneath him, like he almost had like employee, like you were like yeah, I, yeah, I was, I was, yeah, I was under him. Cause I need so to you're run like the game. The runner. Yeah. Okay. I need okay, to the run the game. Runner. Candy runner. You know what okay, I mean? Okay. So I had a bag. I pushed it, and then I wanted to learn it for like <laughs> I pushed the yeah. Bag. I, now we, we, I used to call it jealous. work. I used to call it work. <laughs> I thought I was like you know Frank Lucas or something. Okay. But uh, uh, he wasn't that good at it. And then everybody else kind of sold candy for leisure, and they always got the candy confiscated. And so um, I actually learned inventory from when my stepdad had a snow cone shack in DeSoto. Okay. And um, he got mad because I was leaving with $100 a day just in tips. Mm. And because I knew how to remember customer service, remember people's orders, have it already on time. They told me a time that they was coming, so if I already had it done, they will give me like $10 tip yeah. just for the convenience. And then we had to count inventory. And what I noticed was none of those kids was counting, were counting inventory, so they really didn't know how much money they were supposed to be making per box. Mm, okay. Long story short, I went to my papa. I said I need $150. He took me to Costco in Duncanville. When he got to Costco, got my bag, went back to school, sold out $300 the first day, gave him back his $150 in one day, doubled up, did the same thing again. I ended up in three other high schools, uh, DeSoto, Lancaster, Duncanville, and Cedar Hill. And most of them don't know I was the one that was actually providing the candy. So I was profiting three to four thousand a month. I had like twenty five kids like working for me, and it was cool because I wasn't cool, but the cool kids, you know, what I mean? it was lit. Wait, 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 hold on. So <laughs> you went to these other high schools and found people to sell candy for yeah, you, and well, you trusted them to give you actually give you your money back. Because I counted inventory, so like that I, when they, I had like a sheet. Yeah. Right on top of the bag, and we had the sheet on top of the bag, and then um, we had the sheet on top of the bag, and then you already knew what they was gonna steal. So I said, okay, if y'all can sell out the entire bag by the end of the, by before lunch, you can have this much that you're gonna take. And they all took the same stuff, 
And then um, in Cedar Hill, it was really sweet because Miss Davis was the assistant principal. And uh, she confiscated my stuff one time and she said, are you selling? And I was the only one to tell the truth. So yeah, I'm selling candy. And she was like, why are you doing that? I said, well, everybody else in Cedar Hill, like they living a good life, but we really poor living in the city. So mm-hmm. like, it's this, it's this dichotomy of you in the suburbs, but you poor. But when you go to the hood, your hood friends, supposedly the hood friends got all the J's, all the throwbacks, everything else. And so you too good for your friends from the cliff, but then you too poor for the people in Cedar Hill in the suburbs. So I was just like in that little weird space. And I told her about my parents and she was like, listen, I tell you what, as long as you don't sell in the classrooms and you don't get caught again, I'm not going to say nothing. She gave me my bag back. But what she used to do, she used to confiscate everybody candy and give it to me at the end of the day. And I would fire sell it, let my people fire sell it, make their money. So they like, so they she like would take with everybody me. else's stuff and give yeah. it to you to let you sell it? Yeah, because at some, <laughs> at, at some point in time, my candy became, my bag became my security guard's bag. So I go to the bag, the dude at the front, at the gate, what you need. This was Chick fil A, was brand new in CD Hill. So. Got one Chick Fil A, and then someone wanted like a Snicker bar. Or they wanted like the big uh, extra large Reese's pieces with a big Coke, and I would bring my bag was for the security guards. So the security guards would literally confiscate my competitors who were selling candy, take it to Miss Davis. She would put it in this three big brown boxes. And at the end of the day, I can dump them in my bags. And I gave it to my people to sell. So they like rocking with me because they got to, you know, keep the And you bread. learn how to take care of the people around yeah. you to make everything flow because yeah. it's the team effort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was kind of, okay. Yeah. So you did that out of necessity. You're in high school. Now you're making three to 4000 First of all, I know your mama was like, well, why am I yeah. going to work every day? You at school making probably just as much as I am. You know, my mama, you know, they're, com- they're traditional. So they, they don't care about none of that. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you're going to go to school. You're going to go to college. You're going to do that thing. But they, um, she. Uh, I was giving my mom fifteen hundred dollars a month for at least five months until the school shut me down. Sedeco said, "Uh, uh-uh. uh, mm-hmm. they not even coming to the uh, snack line no more." Yeah, yeah, you can't do that, big dog, Miss Davis. Like, I'm sorry, but it was enough to kind of bridge the gap to kind of help out. My mom was, you know, extremely grateful for that. So that was pretty lit. So you kind of developed this business mindset yeah. in high school out of necessity. Yeah. Um. So how did this transition into where you are now? Yeah, I went to college, um, played ball at college, um, went to a predominantly white institution, lost my scholarship, messing with a chick. Uh, she said, "Oh no, we ain't even just gay, gay past that." <laughs> how do you lose your scholarship messing with a chick? Because I went to like a Christian school. Okay. So you couldn't even hold hands, like, and walk anywhere. Yeah. So. The fact that they thought I got this girl pregnant that was from Plainview, West Texas. Oh, yeah. My mom's from West Texas. So you already know. So I was the first black captain ever at this college, led in every statistic. And it was already looking for a reason because I had at that school, I had a 4.0 GPA. So they looking for a reason like, nah, this nigga's a creative player. And I I screwed up. Messed with a chick. She's actually Hispanic, but she looked like white. Mm Mm-hmm. And um, I went to the um, vice president of student affairs and I told him, I think I got a young lady pregnant. Can I move off campus? Can I get like an exclusion? Because you couldn't leave off campus. He went and told my coach and it was supposed to be confidential between him and I. And all of a sudden my coach is letting go of his best player because I was selfish. But truth came out, he told me years later it was because of that situation. Long story short, the baby wasn't mine. Yeah, so he tried. they tried to call me back to get me to come back, but I already accepted Wiley College, my HBCU, which I had like a year left of school. So that's kind of how I ended up at Wiley. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so then you end up at Wiley, yeah. and then it's now the plan to go into being... No, nah, I was. Business. I wanted to hoop. What you mean? Oh, okay. You, yeah. you were the, okay, you are yeah. going to go to the NBA. I want. I knew I wasn't going to the NBA, but I want, I knew I was. I can make some money overseas. Okay. So my um, my coach was like, uh, uh, Jacobs, when you get here, uh, there's going to be no pro scouts that come here, so don't start that shit. You know, mm-hmm. you, you you need to just do what I tell you to do. My dad looked at him and said, you don't know who you got. So when I came, I told my ACL my 13th game, I had five pro scouts there. Mm-hmm. Coach even came to me crying like, damn, I'm sorry. I, 
I, under, I underestimated you. Yeah. For the record, he just letting everybody know he got some skills. Okay, yeah, we get it. Yeah, I could probably <laughs> bust an ass. Okay. <laughs> Maybe not no more. My heels be hurting and stuff. But um, but no, they uh but there I was cutting hair, right? But cutting the hair, I was like, dang, like I gotta be behind this clipper every day, all day, to not even make half of the money I was making in high school selling candy. So I already knew the importance of scale. So I was kind of getting a taste of what that was like. And mm-hmm. I didn't like for people to be able to call me and be like, hey, Jacobs, like I'm on my way to your dorm. No, you're not, dog. Like, yeah. no, nah, I need to get my hair cut. No, nah, fuck that. Yeah. So I didn't like that. So I shut down the shop. It was popping too. I shut down the shop because I didn't like nobody telling me when to show up, when not to show up. I could believe that. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so that was that. So I shut that down. But then again, at the time, entrepreneurship wasn't a thing like it's today. Like everybody just considers it like this their career. It wasn't no career. It was no. like a a son, like almost like you don't fit nowhere. Yeah. And so I went to, um, of course, I got back on my basketball grind. Long story short. Went to a combine, did extremely well, got offered $10,000 a month to play in Lebanon. And then I had a conversation with Dr. Ajenga and my papa. Dr. Ajenga was the first professor that ever uh, told me that I was more than basketball. Every mm-hmm. other school, they was like, no, just just hoop. Classes were easy. Everything was taken care of. Just go hoop. But at this HBCU, Dr. Ajenga, like, no, nah, you got a 3.9 GPA overall. You don't do it without trying. You need to do more. I'm not impressed. Mm. And at the at first time I had a, a professor that's like, yo, I'm not impressed. She said, Jacobo, you can go anywhere. Mm. And so um, I said, okay, you're right. Took education serious. Started financial literacy organization at Wiley College. Mm-hmm. Uh, we became the first organization in 141 years to get funded by a Fortune 500 company, which was Capital One. Mm-hmm. Um, and they gave us twelve or fifteen thousand dollars. I can't remember at the time, but I was the goat then mm-hmm. because twelve or fifteen thousand dollars in college. Well, yeah. you on? Uh, oh my gosh! You on? Uh, you like I mean? millionaire. Everybody eat. Come yeah, on, yeah. exactly. So, um, and then uh, when I when I when I went and taught at a um, financial conference, it was actually held in Dallas. It was an international business conference, and we had twenty seven schools in twelve different countries adopt my financial literacy case study. And How old that's, are you at this time? Shit, I'm uh, 22. Wow. I'm like 22. Okay. Of course, it was under the guidance of my dean and uh, vice president of financial aid, but that was the first time I said, wow, like the skill sets that I learned in business, they're transferable. Yes. You know, like yeah. I can actually become something more without yeah. having to like toil my body in order to do it. Um, and then... Uh, uh, then I got a nonprofit. We got funded. Came to Lancaster. Start teaching in Lancaster. Um, I got funded thirty three thousand uh, for my nonprofit. Fifty six thousand teaching uh, Lancaster ISD. Uh, Fifty four fifty six thousand teaching Lancaster ISD. And then um, that's when I realized my impact was only going to be so small. Because if these children are going back to broken homes, it's kind of like yeah, doing man. it for not. Like you're planting a seed, hoping that at least one of them can be strong enough to survive their yeah. environment. And then got in financial industry, financial uh, services industry, because I wanted to take financial literacy to the next level. Grew um, extremely big and ended up buying companies and selling companies. And all okay, that wait, stuff. hold on. Okay, so yeah. there's so many questions I have for you. Okay. <sighs> Let me see. Which one do I want to go with first? Because we're yeah. going to get back to the buying and selling companies, right? Yeah. There's two words that you keep mentioning, um, strategy yeah. and scaling. Yeah. What are the biggest mistakes that you see when people are starting companies uh, that makes someone's business strategy trash? Yeah. Well, the first one is you run your company like the job that you had. Oof, that's so real. Um, when you're used to working really hard and receiving a check. Yep. And then you... You go off on your own. Now you have to think about like payroll, like studio, uh, you know, gas and insurance and all of this. Mm -hmm. You're like, okay, well, I was making this much when I was doing this. So I need to get back to there. Mm -hmm. And you end up killing your company because now all the income you make 
you now think is yours. And when you get into business entrepreneurship, now you actually turn into stewardship. And when you start thinking about stewardship, it's like none of this is ours in the first place. Right. When you're an entre- when you're when you work a job, you like so this is my job. You owe me my check. If I don't get that, it's like a take take take, almost like a child position. Mm-hmm. But then when you go into entrepreneurship, you you take you still have that child mentality when you have the responsibility of taking care of other people at the same time. Ooh, tell me about it. I was just talking to uh, <laughs> one of the producers about this. Because, you know, I'm It's a I'm hard now, transition. It's hard. It's, hard. it's, it's like, mentally. wait a minute. I got to pay you first? Yeah. and then My I think brand, it's- my idea, my product, my this, my strategy, my connections, my... But you get paid first? And then don't even get me started on the fact that now I the money that I'm making, I'm like, I have to remember my taxes weren't already yeah, taken out. Yeah, like, they got to come out later and yeah, all of that. I'm way broker right yeah. now, I thought that I was. Yeah. <laughs> so and, and so the that's the first part. The second piece, Jade, is um um it's harder than you think. Oh. Because the, here's here's the misnomer, right? We just gotta talk about real statistics. Only nine percent of businesses ever cost a million dollars in a year ever. Mm. We're wow. not talking about like inconsistently. We're talking about in a year ever. Right. Only 0.6% of businesses actually make it over $10 million. Right. One time. Right. Mm, Only 30% of companies ever sell. And if you're talking about black and brown companies, you're talking about less than 8% of companies ever sell. And so when you start looking at the numbers, I gave you 9% of all businesses. When you start talking about black and brown, the numbers shrink dramatically. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the stuff that we see online and people talking about this, oh, they got a podcast, they doing that. I know a lot of them. They broke. They ain't got it like that. Right. I want y'all to know. I want to me talk about me. <laughs> I, ain't t- I ain't talking about you. Know what no, I'm, I'm saying. Just saying. But it's yeah. true. Like, it's so true because we are not taught. Yeah. Um. We have these great ideas. Yeah. But we don't know how to manage them properly. Yeah. We were never taught how to manage them properly. Yep. Definitely don't know how to scale. Yep. I mean, I think that everybody uses this term of scaling, but it's like, well, what the heck? How, how am I going to do that if right. I don't have the finances to make this thing grow? It's a, it, right. it is confusing. And, and, and But the, the deal is growth and scale are two different things. Okay. Talk so so growth is when you're, so a lot of people think scaling is like, I'm going up. But that's actually growth. Scaling is the moment that your growth surpasses your ability to maintain it. So if your if your infrastructure can only handle a million dollars a year, mm-hmm. but you grow to 10 million a year, mm-hmm. now your infrastructure can no longer sustain the growth. Mm-hmm. Now you have to scale back. Mm-hmm to reinvest and refocus and invest into your infrastructure so that you can grow again. So a lot of people think of scale, like I just want to scale, but by definition, scale means to pull back. Mm-hmm. So you actually lose money in the scale. Okay, okay, okay. Hold on, hold on. Because I, okay. <laughs> yeah. That, that makes sense, but yeah. I, I do want to take, okay, let's take okay. one step back. Okay. Somebody is starting a business right yeah. now. I know we're giving away a lot of game, but it's okay because, you it's know, cool. like, let's talk about the the infrastructure of a business okay. when people are starting a business yeah. what and i know every every business is a little different yeah. but what are the basics of a business infrastructure to make sure that you're even like building the foundation correctly okay so so first and foremost if i were if i were to advise somebody to start a business i actually would tell them to take your route um to go sit under a company that is known to do it at a high level and become the best in that world. Mm-hmm. So many of us, especially millennials, Gen Z, and even you know uh, other other generations, older and younger, um, you don't want to sit under nobody. Mm-hmm. And so we end up. What happens? You end up sitting in a position, but never learn a role. Mm-hmm. So you sit the position. You get good at the position, and you start. You know, I deserve this and that, but you don't understand what cost. What's the cost of the business to keep your role in place? Mm-hmm. That's what you want to learn. Mm-hmm. The cost and the mechanisms of the show. Uh, commercial space. Like, you know, ad space. You have to go and shop and get some ad space and work some deals to make it make sense so that your show stays prominent. I actually would tell people, um, especially our generation and our people that are younger and, you know, uh, 45 and under, sit 
in a space, but for mastery, not just to make a check. Okay. So I hear a lot of people yeah. say, because I, I have learned, it's really kind of sad over the last few years, the importance of mentorship. Yeah. Right? Um, Cause you know, I mean, I guess there's a part of me that's like, well, I guess mentorship is like when you're in college, yeah. high school, yeah. but it's, it's very important. However, the key question for a lot of people is, well, how do I find those people to sit under? Good question. Because unfortunately, especially in our community, yeah. a lot of times it's, it feels like people are not willing to pour. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Or everybody kind of like holds yeah. the, the secrets to themselves. Yeah. When there's obviously enough for everybody to go around. Well, well, this first and first and foremost, what I would say about our community in general, this space that we're in is actually the first time that I will actually say that we our people have been free. Okay. Because freedom is about opportunity, availability, and, emo and information. Okay. This is the first generation that we actually had opportunity, availability, and emotion all at one time. Mm -hmm. You talk about before Jim Crow, say we got free, right? When mm -hmm. we got free, we were free, but with what resources, mm -hmm. what opportunities, what information, and what availability that we have to actually execute that freedom. Mm -hmm. So we all had to kind of like dial the freedom back to say, okay, let's, let's, let's go and talk to Mass about like, can I can just go work for you a little bit? Can I get my checks and roll, right? Then we had the Jim Crow where you had, your opportunity to build your own businesses, but not acceptability or accessibility to the world mm -hmm. or information. So we always had a lack thereof. Mm -hmm. And so every generation prior to this moment in time, have we always been limited to information, opportunity, and availability right. because of social media, because of the Internet and because of the awakening of times. This is the first time that our people have actually, in my opinion, been free enough to actually go and execute their economic freedom to actually go achieve the things that they want to achieve. Okay. So we first have to address the fact that we haven't been free long enough to actually know that it's no longer crabs in a barrel anymore. Or it doesn't have to or be. Or it doesn't have to be. Right. Right? Because at first it was like it's only one spot for diversity and inclusion. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but now it's like, yo, like we can all do the same thing, but you got your own market. Now I understand that enough to say we can collaborate and I can it, it still won't dilute the money that I make right in the right function now you talk about finding a mentor a lot of people look for opportunities just because of notoriety of a company or a brand or how much access uh, accessibility to money they have not knowledge know-how and their time that they're willing to put into you because there are people my 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 very best mentor his name was Tony Stevens mm -hmm. And he's from Turo, Texas, mm -hmm. didn't go to college, mm -hmm. was my most crucial mentor because he taught me all of the basics of storytelling, selling, communication that I still built all of my pieces on today. Mm -hmm. He wasn't the richest. Mm -hmm. He didn't have the most money. Mm -hmm. He didn't live in the largest um, house. He didn't have a life by any fashion that would make anybody. But he had the knowledge and the information that I needed and success enough to make me say, I'm broke. Okay, so right. your 250000 you make is enough right. for me to actually sit under you versus going to talk to somebody that's running a $10 million, $100 million company who doesn't honestly have time. So with people like me, if somebody say, Jake, I want to sit under you, I don't have time for you to sit under me. Right. For me to give you the time that you need. But Jake at 150000 a year, I had a bunch of time. Right. 250000 a year, I had a bunch of time. Right. Now I got staff. I got a team. I got people. I got to make sure that they good. Plus the future and the growth of the company. I honestly don't have time for that. But if you prove yourself, I'll make time when we can find some common ground. Okay. I'm so glad you said that. Um, I, I was moderating a panel probably three weeks ago. Yeah. We started talking about mentorship. And, you know, I, I, I continue with this narrative of saying, like, we have to change the way that we think. Yeah. When it comes to mentorship, mentorship is not I want you to give me all the game and I'm yeah. just going to sit here. Like, what have you done? Yeah. What have you implemented? What have you, you know? And it's so funny you say that because the guy on the panel basically said there was this guy that he, I guess he was a big wig at a company that he whatever this career was he wanted to be into long story short he went to a conference and this guy is there and he's like i am going to get next to this guy Got it. he gets next to the guy and the guy literally tells him you have 15 seconds so he's like 
Thank God he was prepared. He said, I did all the work. I did the research. I researched this man. I researched the company. So my question wasn't basic like everybody else's yeah. question. And because he stood out, the guy was like, give me a call. Yeah. Let's set up a 30-minute conversation. And the guy ended up mentoring him later. Yeah. Basically, the point of all this is like we have to do the work yeah. in order to, like, I guess, even step to somebody like you to yeah. say, like, make make it worth your time to invest yeah. in me. Not because I'm sitting here as a blank slate and yeah. you're just going to sit up here and, you know, like, hold my hand. You see that I've already been putting in the work. Like, I just need to be fine-tuned, yeah, right? So, so, so Scripture says faith without works is dead, and people, sure. people sit on that. Like, mm. of course, faith without works is dead. But in my definition that God gave me a digital download is faith is to believe it's already done and yep. to work as if you're already there. Mm. So, so faith is, I believe it's already done. So if I believe that this person is my mentor, I have to work as if I'm already there. That's good. So how do I get there? What do they like? What interests do they have? What are their mannerisms? What are the things that they hate? What are the business, you know, mantras that they live by the success standards? What type of people are around them? Who do they say that they mentor? So I can emulate becoming there Mm -hmm. like them so that, it can actually manifest that it's done. And so when we talk about this construct of just mentorship or even success in general, you become a millionaire before you have a million dollars in your bank account. Mm. Now, what do you mean? It's not that, okay, Jake, by literal standards, you're not a millionaire until you have the assets of a millionaire, mm. but you can't actually make a become a millionaire or make a million dollars if you don't become somebody who is worthy of attracting a million dollars, worthy of attracting your dream relationship, worthy of attracting the dream situation that you want to be in. So we're magnets, right? So, okay, what is the action of this millionaire? How do they wake up? Mm. How do they handle relationships? Mm. How do they communicate? Do they use clear words? Are they fully understanding and aware of their industry and their space and their market? Do they do they know these things? Because these things doesn't make for somebody who's above or below standard. Mm. These are not average people. Mm -hmm. These are people who are obsessing over becoming who they want to become. Therefore, you becoming that and you can't help but make the money that you attract and you bring into the market. So with that being said, Exodus 18, Jethro was registered to almost kind of be like the first consultant, if you will, in scripture. Mm-hmm. He's, he's you know, talking to Moses. And Moses is, you know, he, he tough right now. You know, mm-hmm. just got people out of Egypt. You know, they er, er, doing their thing. You know, talking about, <laughs> yeah. They get to, you know, start barbecuing and yeah. stuff. So Jethro, <laughs> let me tell you what's going oh, on. No, not barbecuing the man. Barbecue. <laughs> you know, they barbecue. You hear me? So Moses, you know, they barbecue. And, you know, you know offering ain't nothing but a barbecue. And, you know, you know it's, so, so it's funny that when they come through, Jethro comes back, bring Moses' family to him. And Moses, just like we do, man, I've been doing this. I've been doing that. I've been, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh. Uh. I've been, I got a million people out of Egypt. Man, we over here and we, we finna step into the land of the mm, milk and honey. You feel me? <laughs> and Jethro, and it's funny because in scripture, out of all like the little low key boasting, it says on the next day. So it's almost like the mentor is like, eh, let's see what you're talking about. So then Jethro cut scene now he observing Moses while he doing his work he look at Moses and say what you're doing is not good Mm -hmm. so what do we do when we feel like we're on our stuff and somebody we look up to come to us and like bro what you doing it ain't good we immediately think oh you hating dog yeah but you hating on me Jethro yeah what God told me to do is for me I gotta look out for the people I gotta be the one to do it and Moses Jethro looking at Moses like dog He said, listen, you can take this up with your God, Mm -hmm. whatever you're going to do, but let me just tell you how it's going to be. And these are the three things that he tells us to look for. And if if a mentor is looking for a mentee, they're looking for somebody who can carry the mantle. Mm -hmm. And mentees don't want to do the work to become worthy of the mantle. The sacrifice, the blood, the backstabbing. Like you, you, you looking, you looking, you looking at my stage and you don't know the blood that I shed to be on the stage. Mm. You don't know, you don't know what I went through just to stand here and smile. You don't know, you see me smiling and dancing, but you don't understand how much work I had to do to get myself over 
being uncomfortable, being in the spotlight to even have this position, but yet you want me to just to put you in there mm-hmm. after I spent 15, 20 years actually getting myself ready for it. That's good. That's good. You know, we talk about David. I'm going to go back to the Jethro story, but we talk about David. David at 12, between 12 and 14 was, was supposed to be next king. He didn't become a king to 30, 33. Mm-hmm. He was around 30, 33 when he had the first kingdom and he became kingdom a king of Israel at th- around 33. Mm-hmm. You're talking about 20 some years. Mm-hmm. Jesus went from odd uh, that he disappeared for 20 years and came back 30, 30, killed it. What is the saying? You got to put 10, 20 years in the game yeah. before you can actually get what God called of your life. So Jethro told Moses, he said, listen, son, let me tell you this. There are three things you look for. You got to find people who are capable. Now, it's funny that scripture used capable and not willing, Mm -hmm. because willing, by definition, Jade, are people who are excited to do something. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that they have the knowledge, know-how, or ability to execute. Mm -hmm. Capable means you're already efficient at what I need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, a mentor not trying to teach you the basics. Mm -hmm. You got to do that work on your own. Exactly. A mentor is trying to teach you how to master the basics because you can already do what I need you to do. Right. That's a mentor. A mentor needs that. The yeah. second thing they said, you look for people that have the same type of discipline, morality that you have. Mm-hmm. So, okay, yeah, you want this person to be your mentor, but do you know their lifestyle? Mm-hmm. Because who you emulate is what you're going to become. That's so, uh, this <laughs> discipline piece is really important. I just had this conversation with somebody last night because they're surrounded around people that want to be in their industry. Yeah. And I'm like, but are they doing what you did to get to where Come you on. are? They want you to just give them give the green them. light. But you're waking up 3, 4 Come o'clock on. in the morning. Mm. Um, you put in all this work. Come like on. It's the music industry, right? So I'm like, you made thousands of beats before yeah. anybody ever put you on, yeah. right? Or before anybody said, okay, I'm going to give you the green yeah. light. Are they bringing thousands of beats to you yeah. and like knocking down your door saying, here, I have another one. Yeah. I stayed up last night. I, no, they want you like you made it. You did the work. So come on, man. You can yeah. make me surpass all that. It don't work like <laughs> it that. It don't work like no. that. Like you got to put in your game. And then the third thing is you uh, you want to you want to deal with people who don't take easy bribes. In scripture, what it's referring to is people that's not there for the money. Mm. Because you can't be there for the money if you made it to the top of your game. Mm. It's more than money. Yeah. Like it's if it was about the money, you would have got out. Yeah. A long time. You know what I mean? So it's it's more than just the money. So if I see you and I'm looking and as a mentor, I know for a fact I've seen a thousands of you. Yeah. I've seen hundreds. I've seen I've seen you in many different forms coming off the street. I want to learn from you to what? Pimp me? Hmm. So I can put you in a position for you to down talk me because I didn't what do what for you? So when you start looking at those things, I start saying, wow, the true work is on the mentee, not the mentor. Mm-hmm. That's good. The true work is in the follower, mm-hmm. not the one who set the tone. Right. And so when you're looking at those uh, dynamics and somebody like your question, if I'm looking for someone to follow, I got to find, do I fit all of those monikers of that person? And if I do, all I got to do is speak it. It's already done. Let me work to make sure I get there. Mm-hmm. There has not been one person that I have not put on my my list, my hit list of who I, who I am going to talk to at what point in time. One of my closest friends right now, he's probably, he's, he's considered uh, one of the best to ever do it in his industry. Mm-hmm. A decade ago, mm-hmm. I met him at a conference. And I said, one day you and I, um, you and I are going to be friends. Right now, I'm not worthy of your friendship. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> what did he look at you and say, Jake, when you said that? He said, mm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> then he said, yeah. Uh, Iggy, no. He said, mm, okay. Mm-hmm. I said, right now, I'm not worthy of your friendship because a true friendship means that I can deliver at the same capacity that you deliver for me. Mm-hmm. I'm not, listen, one day we're going to be friends. But until then, I'm going to keep working, and one day it's going to happen. Boy, me and him, tight. Thick as thieves now. And you know you know what's crazy? What got me into the world was he do so much for his people, his team, and for the community. I sent him $5,000. I DM'd him, send me your number. I want to bless you. He said, all right, you know, all right, cool. I said, you got Zelle cash out. I prefer Zelle. It don't take any money. He's like, all right, cool. He sent it. All right, this it? All right, sent him 5000 He called me. We never talked on the phone. He called me like, hey, what's this for? Like, what's up? I said, dog, I told you a decade ago, 
that you and I were going to be friends. And I, I, I'm in a position that you are right now, and I know that nobody's pouring into you. Mm, that's good. So this is me pouring in before I even extract anything. Mm. He said, hey, can you meet me in Las Vegas in two days? <laughs> 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 Flew to Las Vegas. He and I became tight. We started building our relationship. So what am I saying? It's not about money. It's about can I identify and see and sow into you in moments and times. Now, that $5,000 to him is nothing. But in, in retrospect to his friends that's been around him for decades, it's a lot that somebody told him a decade ago that we're going to be friends. And before I even get in your circle, I respect you enough to sow a seed before I step in. Who, who, who does that? And, it's, and I'll say this. <laughs> so for everybody watching, like, it's not a, like you said, it's not about... It's not about the money yeah. in a sense of like, because somebody's listening it's and taking it very, yes, yeah. they're taking it very surface level. Well, I ain't yeah. got $5,000 yeah, to send to somebody or whatever. It's it's not about that. It is literally, that was your way to yeah. sow, uh, but there are so many other ways to sow. In other words, it's like the, how they always say, we're, we're waiting on God to give us a blessing, yeah. but we got to put the wood in but, yeah, before we got, get the fire. You got to sow it for sure. And then, and, then, well, and then if you think about it, like the first thing people say is, let me take you for dinner or let me take you for coffee. I can buy my own dinner and coffee. Right. Because all you're going to be doing is asking me questions. Yeah. That's there's just, that's there's just nothing a to... <laughs> I can get from you, dog. Like there's there's nothing I can get. From, I, I'd rather go and take myself out Yeah. to the most finest dinner without having to answer questions because I got to answer questions every day. Yeah. You're not doing me a favor by buying me lunch, dinner, or whatever. But if you say I'll drive for you every day for a year and I won't say a word. Wait a minute now. I just want to be in a space. I want to be. That's a different type of servitude because scripture says the greatest among us would be a servant of all. That's the piece mm -hmm. that people miss. When you look at these billionaires, they're billionaires because they found a way to serve a billion people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The more people you can set yourself up to serve. This is like me, me laying myself down on the ground without any expectation that you'll ever see me. But because I value what you do, I'm willing to do that because of you. Because one day I'm going to be in a position and I'm going to need somebody to do that, too. Ooh, that's good. I really <laughs> hope this is not going over people's head. Like the, the example you just gave about I will drive for you for free for yeah. a year. Again, I want to just make sure everybody's getting the visual of Get all Get the of context. This. Yeah. You are... Not only sowing the seed, you are putting your like. There's conversations that are going on that that yeah. they can soak up. That's right. They are they are learning mannerisms. That's they right. are learning the the language. That's right. You know they are. Whoo, and there's a clear Lord. sacrifice. If, there's a clear if, if sacrifice. If you with me four to six hours a day, I know you're losing money. <laughs> like I know it, but because you're willing to sit under, that's the that's the piece. Like 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 for some reason there is some some type of like degrading factor that the that the enemy has set in that it like you feel bad to sit under somebody. No, oh, yeah. How so can true. I want you to be my mentor, but I'm not willing to sit under you to serve you? Mm -hmm. Because for me to give you my spotlight, for me to give you my stage, for me to give you my platform, what I sacrifice for, I got to know that you care about it just as much as I care about mm -hmm. it. That's how you put yourself in a room. Mm -hmm. And the best Artists are the ones that was writing songs for people for a decade. Nobody knew them. And then they got onto the scene. The best, the best producers and business people are the people that sat under somebody that mm -hmm. took a dimmer light that brought the most value to it. And then they were, they didn't want to leave. They had to leave because there was no more room for them. See, those are the people I was telling, I was telling Russ uh, when, when I talked to him on the phone, I said, listen. I didn't want to be an entrepreneur. Did I tell you that? I said, man, I, I wanted to be a top executive for somebody I could serve. I didn't want to have to deal with the stress of, dang, I got to I gotta sell. When you're an owner and you're a leader, you, you got to sell your assets to save the company before anybody. And you got to be willing to give it all up for the mission. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I wanted to get my check, get my little equity, do my thing, and got that going to stunt. Yep. But at some point in time, when that person that you're following no longer wants to grow, and in order to keep you in position, they got to stifle you, 
You go somewhere else, you're like, okay, it's the same thing. Let me go on and do it on my own. And by happenstance, you go and build it. I have never met anyone that's done millions of dollars on a consistent basis, that's impacted the community on a consistent basis, that actually set out to put themselves out first. Mm -hmm. The people that make the most impact didn't even want to be in a spotlight at first. Yeah. They wanted to elevate somebody else until you just had to get out there. Yeah, yeah. I hope y'all getting out this game. I'm like, oh my gosh. Look, we might not even air this. I'm just going to go home and watch it myself. Okay. Jake, this is so, yeah. so, so good. Oh, this is so good. Yeah. I have a million questions. Okay. Where, where we at on time? Well, I'm just going to ask y'all. Okay. We got, you said four more minutes? Oh, shoot. We, 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 we way over. Let's, okay. Okay. Come on. You just going to have to come Sorry, back for part two. No, this is, this is really, uh, this is so applicable. Um, okay. So in rapping, <laughs> like I'm we're just, just underdeveloped. Like, like, like us serving, we're underdeveloped. It's changing Our the skill mentality, sets, we're though. underdeveloped. Our mentality is underdeveloped. Our entitlement, like the people that got entitlement, like dog entitlement. I lost more money than you want to ever make. I gave it all back to make sure my squad ate. And you want to sit in my seat? Hmm. You want you, you think this crown? I, I don't want to wear it. <laughs> and I just see so many people with such good skill set and so much potential just screw it up because you don't want to wait your turn. Hmm. And waiting your turn is not a diminishment of your value. Waiting your turn is going to be a com it's, it's a compliment to your skill set being developed. It's an humbleness because how can you expect someone to sit under you and serve you if you were never willing to sit under somebody and serve them? Hmm. How can you attract the best talent if you want the best talent for somebody else first? Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's very rare that I'm speechless, but okay, this is this is good, Jake. This is this is excellent actually. Okay. <laughs> Tell them how they can get in contact with you. I can't even Listen. like how do you even how do I even follow that? Um <laughs> I, I don't think that you well, I, I know that you actually realize um the gift that God has given you. I it's interesting to that you you're very clear on your purpose. And it is a lot. I mean, because we come in here and again, like our people eat with their eyes. So we talk money. Right. Because like you said, oftentimes we won't follow people unless they look like where we're going. Yeah. Or where we want to go. Um, and even though you do fit all of that for a lot of people listening, because you're very successful. Um, you staying on this mental shift. Being a servant. Um. <laughs> oh Lord Jesus. Okay. It, I mean, it's hitting you. Could you? You were that though. You know what I mean? Like, like you're the example of that, Jay. But I think it's frustrating to people a lot of times because, if I'm being honest, like everything that you're saying, it it, it makes sense. But sometimes it seems as if. Having the servant mentality, willing to pay, play the back, willing to like wait your turn, you know. Yeah, I, let me just say this. <clears throat> it seems like the good guy doesn't win a lot you're, of times. You're looking to impact them, but the learning lesson is for you. Let me tell you why. I'll give this example. An apple tree, it takes seven to ten years to have its first good bushel of apples. Hmm. Now, when the apple tree seed is placed into the ground, the, the potential of that tree is now planted. Mm -hmm. But it's not ready to handle the weight of the fruit. Mm -hmm. So the tree grows. Year one, year two, this apple tree is asking God, like, God, I thought I was an apple tree. Mm -hmm. I, I, th I got all this fruit inside of me. Mm -hmm. I see all these other trees, and they got fruit, and I'm of the same Stature, I got the same ability. Matter of fact, I think my fruit is going to be more like juicy and sweet. Like I got that good stuff inside of me. But if God were to allow an apple tree in year two 
to birth a bushel of apples, the weight of the fruit will be too much. The weight of the fruit will be too much for the tree to handle, Jay. Mm -hmm. Because every apple comes with a pound to two pounds of weight. Yeah. So when you got this bushel of apples on a tree that's too young, the fruit that's supposed to be the thing that attracts the most people will be the very thing that weighs down the tree and kills the tree. Mm -hmm. The tree has to first learn how to deal with handling harsh environments. The tree has to first learn how to deal with uh, spectators and, and, and birds and insects pulling from the tree but not adding to it. The tree has to learn how to dig deeper. See, what makes the tree grow and makes it stronger is that contrary to popular belief, the wind that pushes the tree, every time the tree bends, it signals to the roots to dig deeper. Mm. Well, if the source that the tree is digging into is not of substance, when it digs deep, it's not going to dig deep enough to handle the weight. It's going to fall over. Mm -hmm. But if that soil is deep enough, that's that mentorship. It's who you're seeking mentorship. If it's deep enough to handle why you're learning, it can handle the weight. It's been there before. It can give you guidance, give you courage before. Now, as the tree begins to bend, the, the, the roots dig deeper and then it gets stronger. It gets stronger. And all of the strength comes underneath ground first. Mm -hmm. And then one day, maybe year seven or maybe year 10, that first good bushel of apples come. Mm -hmm. And the tree can handle the weight of its fruit while holding the weight of the world. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people want the weight of the fruit, but they don't want the weight of the world that comes with the fruit. Mm -hmm. Because when you have fruit, people come and pick at it. Mm -hmm. Ooh. They, come and, they, they come and hang on it. Mm -hmm. But the beautiful thing about fruit, when you got good fruit, mm -hmm. you ain't got to go search nowhere for it. I ain't, when the last time you see an apple tree walking down the highway, mm. talking about, go get this fruit. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> It'll scare you. <laughs> You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> Every father. But when you got good fruit from good soil, once one person take a bite, the world is going to come. But if that tree can't handle the weight of the world... It's trained before the world comes. And that's where a lot of us are missing. It's the training to handle the weight of the world when you're the only sun, a sun shining, when you're, the, when you're the face of the brand, when now you can't blame the station you came from. Mm -hmm. Now the blame and the lawsuit is going to you. Mm -hmm. Can you handle that? And you handle that under the covering of someone. Mm -hmm. And then when it's time for you to stand on your own, you can stand on your own. And that's the piece that so many of us are missing because we're chasing money and we don't even know the statistics of money. The average millionaire that actually becomes a millionaire, they don't become a millionaire to 37 assets wise. You don't become a liquid millionaire. The average ordinary American job, business or whatever, you don't have a liquid million dollars until average 51 years old. Hmm. So what are people chasing? What are people chasing? Hmm. You chasing money and you're shortcutting people, burning bridges only to get to the age. Now, you can't call nobody because you burnt everybody along the way. Hmm. Your name is more precious than silver and gold. How do you do that? By pulling your time. And now when you build your company and you're calling your team to make sacrifices that you made, you can say, I sat under. For 10, 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And you can say that from experience. And that's the piece of Jesus that people miss. Mm -hmm. That's the piece of Moses that people miss. I can go scripture. Naomi was, uh, Ruth was, was, uh, uh, was, was, was mentored by Naomi. Mm -hmm. We don't know how many years that was. It just says a time. So when you think of the greatest people in scripture or even the greatest people in life, they all had someone they sat under long enough to give them what they needed to survive. And that's the piece that we're missing. That piece of sitting under because everybody wants the light. But if that fruit in that tree hit that light before it can handle it, it's going to weld that tree up. Stop. Okay. Cut. Cut. No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. So, uh, no, this is good. Yeah. Um, 
All right, Pastor Jake, <laughs> tell everybody how they can get. <laughs> Forget yeah. Doctor Jake. All right, y'all. Uh, tell everybody. Y'all how still they can... like communion? You know? <laughs> I like communion. Uh, Somebody pass the plate, please. Uh, Lord, uh, everybody. No, you know, thank you for your time. Whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Take that. Um, yeah, seriously, let everybody know how they can um, follow your yeah. journey. How they can get in contact with you. Yeah, you can. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram or social media, Jake Taylor Jacobs. Uh, you spell Taylor with an E R, not an O R. So Jake Taylor with an ER Jacobs. And then our company sites is the bizcofirm um, dot com. But the biggest thing, don't, don't, don't reach out to me if you don't have a true intention of going from good to great. Mm. Don't I don't like talking to people that only want to make money, mm. nor do I like talking to people that only want to make an impact. Mm. You need both. You need a balance of them both. So don't reach out to us or our team if you're looking for a shortcut. Like I tell people all the time, Jay. I can't teach you how to make a million dollars tomorrow, mm -hmm. but I can teach you how to be a millionaire for the rest of your life. Mm. And the only way that I can do that is first starts internal. And then from there, we can start building the external things because making money is easy, but changing how you see yourself and how you see money, that's the hard part. Bye, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I got to get myself together. Thank you for your time today. I appreciate sure. it. Woo, Lord. Appreciate it, yeah. Thanks for the support. Make sure you subscribe to the Dash Podcast YouTube channel. Also, we're available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more. And feel free to share with some family and friends. Thanks, guys.